In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, it is time for me to drop off a new mock draft. It's only the first 10 picks, but I'm going to give you the first 10 picks of my updated mock draft based off the Tankathon standings. Let's see. Is there any surprises? Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I hope everybody had a great weekend. It is a happy Monday for me. And this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is where first time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with the promo code Locked On. That is prizepicks.com and the promo code is Locked On. Like I said in the opening, this mock draft is based off of the standings on Tankathon. And as of today, Monday, January 23rd, the Houston Rockets have the number one pick. And it is a no-brainer who they would select. Victor Wimbayama, 7'4", 240 pounds, defensive extraordinaire, shot maker, plays like a wing, has just done... Everything, at least in my opinion, to exceed the high expectations that I and other people have had for him. Just a totally different player than what he was last year and what he was able to show last year in a, you know, a very limited role in Asvel. I mean, the the move to go from Asvel to the Metropolitans was a big, big move as far as his development. The competition is a, a step back as Asvel is in the EuroLeague, but it, it was just the best decision for his development but here's something that could be very interesting and it actually happened in 2017 with Frank Nilakina. but there's a chance that Victor Wimbayama could lead his team to the French finals and the French finals I don't have the exact dates but I know in years past it has always ended around the last week in June so what happens if the French finals game falls on the day of the NBA draft or around it. And I, I've talked to his agent and they're definitely going to make some changes and adjust it. But even if he does make the draft, it could be a situation where let's say he has a game on Monday and the draft is, I don't even know the exact date of the draft. I think it's on a Wednesday and the draft is on Wednesday and his team has a game on Thursday if you're Wimbayama, what is more important? Being drafted and, you know, the once in a lifetime opportunity to shake the commissioner's hand? Or do you put team first and put yourself put yourself and your team in the best position to win a championship? To me, that is like really the only mild concern right now from whatever team that drafts them. In this case, Houston, it's I mean, it's really not a concern at all. This is just more so a a concern for for Victor, a decision that he would have to make. But that is really the only very, very, very minor issue around Wimbayama and being number one is just what is he going to do on draft day? Now, I like to do things a little different. I know most times when guys release mock drafts, they just put the team and they just release you know a, a paragraph or a few sentences about the player but I like to try to figure out the fit whether it's a good fit or a bad fit and in Houston I mean Houston is going to select him number one even though Alperin Shingun in my opinion has been their best player especially over the last 10 games I think that Houston should absolutely try to build around him I agree with Anthony Edwards even though Anthony Edwards made the comment I want to say a few weeks ago that Houston and I'm just paraphrasing here should build around number 28 talking about Shingun and then he actually like really banged out on him twice in the game on Saturday but Shingun has been averaging like 18 points 10 rebounds and six assists in his his last 10 games and to me he's the Rockets best pastor best passer and he has a he's their Basically, I think Houston should just build Alperin Shingun. But if Victor Wimbayama's there, 
at least Shingun has is a valuable trade chip that could bring them a a good point guard in return. Now, like I said, Houston is not going to think twice about drafting Wimbayama despite having Shingun on the roster. But what's pretty cool to me is that Wimbayama, if he ends up going to Houston, would be their fourth number one pick in the last 40 years. And they selected Ralph Sampson, number one. I think it was 1983. Hakeem Olajuwon, which was in the Jordan year. And then Yao Ming in, I think, 2004. Why do, why do I know this? Yeah. Anyway, maybe it was two. Th- I don't I don't even remember this. But anyway, the last 40 years, Houston has drafted a center number one three times with each of their first picks. And they, they're all Hall of Famers. So Wimbenyama could be next. If he ends up in Houston, and then it would be just a perfect situation for him to be mentored by Hakeem Olajuwon, who spends a little bit of time in the area. All right, at number two, the Detroit Pistons, and this is where a little controversy was uh, (laughs) last week. It's weird that I had made the comment, I I talked about it on a podcast on, on Friday with Sam, that I... I'm high on Brandon Miller, and I made the comment that if Detroit has the number one pick, they don't need Scoot. So I'll, I'll, I guess, re-talk about or rediscuss my thinking in the process. But anyway, for this mock draft, I do have the Pistons selecting Scoot Henderson at number two. Now, Scoot has been that guy. I mean, he's been the guy that everybody has has said is the only challenger to win Bayama, the only potential challenger. Uh, to be selected ahead of Wimbayama, which I do not think that is going to happen. Scoot has has been having a good year. He's he's he missed the last two games. I don't know exactly why he missed the last two games, and uh, his season has been cut short a little bit due to like a nasal fracture. But he's still averaging twenty points, about six assists, five rebounds, and sixteen total games. Even though the G League schedule is like weird, like the regular season just started and then they had a showcase and, and then a cup or whatever but Detroit is going to select Scoot number two that's just my guess if I were a betting man they'd select a number two but in my personal opinion I would really 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 take a long hard look at Brandon Miller and maybe just because I believe in Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey more than others and and it's something that Sam Ferris, my guy from the Draft Dummies, touched on is that we always talk about fit, right? We talk about from the team perspective, you don't you don't draft for fit. You take best player available. But on the flip side, fit is so important for the player success, right? So you want to put the guy that you draft in the best position to succeed. And I personally don't think if you have Scoot Henderson, Cade Cunningham, and Jaden Ivey, you're putting those three guys in the best position to succeed. It's not the popular choice. It's going against the consensus. And I guess when I made a comment on Twitter, I didn't realize it was such a big deal. I mean, I was at a game and a scout from a team (laughs) mentioned it to me. Uh, the, the Ringer Draft podcast kind of mentioned, uh, gave me a shout out based off the, the tweet and all the drama that that um, my my tweet caused. But again, I'm just going to stand on it. And also, I feel like just because a person is the best player available on draft day doesn't mean that they're going to be the best fit long term or the person that is drafted as the best fit can also be the best player available. But Detroit more than likely, is going to take Scoot, and it kind of fits what Troy Weaver likes. He has a reputation for valuing athleticism, and adding Scoot would give Detroit another explosive floor general who a lot of people have compared to Derrick Rose. But I I like Jaden Ivey. I do like Jaden Ivey, and I, I do like Cade Cunningham. I'm talking about a guy that has been injured, but I think he was at like 19, 6, and 6. I know some people are saying, well, I can move Cade to the 3 and, and so on, but Again, this is just my opinion. I do think that you'd have to take a long, hard look at Brandon Miller if you are the Detroit Pistons and you are selecting at number two. All right, when we return, I'll get into the Charlotte Hornets who are projected to pick third, and I have them selecting Brandon Miller, and I'll give you my thoughts on why I think Brandon Miller would be a really good fit in Charlotte. But let's talk about prize picks. If you don't know what prize picks is, It is daily fantasy made easy. 
You pick two to six players and you decide if they will score more or less than the prize picks projection. You can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It is just you first the projections available and prize picks offers projections on any sport you watch. NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, PGA, men's and women's college basketball, WNBA. They even have cricket, cricket, MMA, boxing, like I said, any sport you can think of. And the entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It is that easy. It is safe and fast withdrawals. And it is currently operational in 30 states and Canada. So download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. If you're a first time user, you can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize picks will give you 100 bucks. If you deposit 50, prize picks will give you 50. So do not forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for instant deposit match up to $100. All right, once again, thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. All right, I left off at number three, and it is the Charlotte Hornets based off a of tankathon. I have them selecting Brandon Miller. No brainer here. Miller has been, in my opinion, the best newcomer in this highly touted freshman class that I think is going to make up the majority of the lottery. He's played 19 games so far for Alabama, averaging a little under 20 points and eight rebounds per game. 46, 46, 83 shooting splits. And coming into this season, he was a guy that a lot of people were divided on. I actually had one scout tell me that he thought Miller was the second best player in the draft. And then most of the people had him somewhere in the middle, but there were some guys that had him in the 20s. I mean, his age was used against him. There were some people that didn't believe in the shooting. Like I remember, and I wrote an article on it, one guy said he just felt like his shooting hasn't progressed over the last few years. Well, he was wrong because Miller is shooting 46% from three on a healthy diet of attempts. And if you are a, a critic, which he has plenty of critics, he's still divisive on social media. But you can't deny what he's done. You, you had to adjust your rankings and just based off his production and shooting. And if you haven't, then I don't know. I guess maybe you're just being stubborn and sticking to uh, <laughs> sticking to your, your preseason rankings. Now, the fit with Charlotte, I think, would be good. I think it would be a great fit. I mean, I think Charlotte needs to kind of start from scratch, which is weird considering that Last year, they were 43-39. and 39. They made the play-in game, and they looked like they were headed in the right direction. But we all know what happened in the offseason from the Miles Bridges situation to the coaching situation, then LaMelo Ball having um, a couple sprained ankles didn't hurt. Um, James Booknight situation didn't hurt. I mean, it's just been an absolute mess in Charlotte, but I think Brandon Miller has the size and shooting and even rebounding that could help. And then I, I expect Hayward or, or Gordon Hayward or Terry Rozier. I don't expect them back with Charlotte to start next season. So I do like the fit for Brandon Miller in Charlotte. All right, at number four, it is the San Antonio Spurs. Again, this is based off of Tinkathon, and I have them selecting Ah Men Thompson. You know, it's kind of weird for me to talk about the Spurs being in the lottery for the third straight year I mean like my whole adult life the San Antonio Spurs were like a playoff contender I mean they had like obviously Tim Duncan Manu Ginobili Tony Parker and Kawhi Leonard I mean they've had the foundational pieces where they've just been able to transition from it being Duncan's team to Tony Parker had the keys one year I mean it was still Duncan's team but there was a point where it seemed like the offense was being more ran through Tony Parker then you had the Kawhi Leonard um, time where he was like the the MVP of the finals and basically San Antonio had just been blessed where they had this foundational piece where everybody around Tim Duncan was better and right now San Antonio is in search of that type of player that can be a foundational piece. And right now, I think San Antonio has drafted well. I mean, you can obviously think Vassell was selected over Halliburton. You can say that was a mistake. The Josh Primo situation was a mistake. But I think San Antonio has drafted. I mean, I think they've drafted well. 
But they need like this great player. They need this superstar. And I think Amin Thompson could be that guy. We all know that he is an outlier athlete. I mean, from day one, he would be one of the most explosive players in the NBA. He's an exceptional passer. He has the potential to be a great two-way player, a great defender. Obviously, the big, big concern, and you can't mention the Thompson's name without mentioning the shooting. San Antonio does have a track record of developing shooters, but Chip England, the guy who gets a lot of credit for Kawhi Leonard's shooting improvement, is now with the Oklahoma City Thunder, which I think was a a great move by the Thunder. But from a fit standpoint, Amin would be great in San Antonio. I like Trey Jones, but I think Trey Jones is a, a game manager, a guy that is going to play a long time as a backup point guard, someone that is going to help your team win the plus minus battle when the star's out. And I think Amin is a star, and I think Trey Jones would be the perfect backup for him. Now, they both kind of struggle with shooting. I think Trey Jones is under like 30% from three. But I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm in could be that type of starter, that type of foundational piece, if everything improves with the shooting. All right, at number five, it is the Orlando Magic, and I have Orlando selecting Keontae George, a 6'4 guard from Baylor. Now, I've been following Keontae since he was a freshman in high school at Louisville, Texas. He's always passed my eye test. He's always been a guy that he just looks the part. He's a gifted scorer. He has a deep bag of tricks. He can score from the mid-range, which you're not really seeing a whole lot of. He can shoot the pull-up jumper. He can create his own shot. He has a nice soft touch around the rim. He's a guy that I just really, really like. Now, on paper, I get it. On paper, the shooting splits don't stand out. It's like 39% from the floor, 35% from three, 78% from the foul line. They do not scream efficiency, but I'm going to trust my eyes. I mean, I wear glasses, so maybe that's good or maybe that's bad. But I'm going to trust my eyes with Keontae and the eye test. Now, if he goes to Orlando, the fit... It's disgusting. It, it is a horrible fit. <laughs> Based off their roster, he just joined another logjam of guards. Um, you know, I don't expect Gary Harris and Terrence Ross to be there next year. But even if they are gone, you still have Markel Foltz, who's their starter, and he's been their best guard. You have Cole Anthony. You have Jalen Suggs. Adding another guard to the mix is not ideal. And then there's rumors that Orlando is looking to trade for Fred Van Vliet, trade, um, make a trade with Toronto. Maybe they would consolidate some of the guards there. But I, I just wouldn't like to fit for any guard going to Orlando unless some changes are made. Just Orlando, period. I mean, it's just a bunch of – it's it's just a logjam and, and a bunch of redundant skill sets. And I also think that Keontae is going to eventually end up being a primary ball handler. I think that he's shown enough flashes and improvements this year as a a passer and playmaker that I'm comfortable with him developing into a, a, a primary ball handler in the near future. All right, at number six, I have the Washington Wizards selecting Nick Smith Jr. Now, I'll get to the fit in a second, but it is kind of like the opposite of Keontae George going to Orlando because Nick Smith would have a – I mean, I think he would be a great fit next to Bradley Bill, but I'll get to that in a second. The big question about Nick Smith is, has he played his last game for for Arkansas? Now, I I talked to some scouts, and they think, like, he's done. They think, like, he's not going to play. I've heard that his dad has disputed that, saying that he will come back. And I did talk to one particular scout that mentioned to me that he believes that Nick Smith will return to Arkansas's lineup before SEC play. Now, the three games, well, he played five games, but the three games that he played without a minutes restriction, he averaged 19 points, and he showcased why people were high on him. I, I know there was a, a scout for a team that told me that after seeing him at the McDonald's game and at the Jordan Brand Classic, he felt like Nick Smith was the best guard outside of Scoot Henderson. So, um, unfortunately, he just, he's just he been injured. Hasn't been able to showcase everything that he has in this game due to what they're calling, like, right knee management. But as far as the fit, I mean, Bradley Bill would be the perfect 
the perfect player to put next to Nick Smith, or, or I should say the other way around, Nick Smith would be the perfect prospect to put next to Bradley Bill. One, because they have a relationship. Nick Smith played for Bradley Bill Elite, so they already know each other. I think Bill would be a very good mentor to him. And Nick can play on and off the ball. I think he's a good enough shooter to where if they're running Bill as the, the pick and roll ball handler or whatever as, as the main guy, then Nick can play off of him. So I like that fit there. I think it would be a very good fit from a basketball and mentorship standpoint. All right, when we return, I'll talk about the last picks, picks 7 through 10. But let's talk about our new sponsor. This is big. This is big. It's real big. It's our new sponsor, and it is FanDuel. We are excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America. It is FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better because they have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. New customers, if you join today and get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Let me read that again. New customers, join today and get started with $150 in free bets when you place your first $5 bet. So I just had to... Make sure that you heard that correctly. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash LockedOnNBA. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to the point spreads to player props. Plus, you can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. It's all on the app, and it's safe, and it's secure, and it's easy to use. So football fans, do not miss out. Place your first $5 bet and get $150 in free bets. Win or lose, FanDuel.com slash LockedOnNBA. Make every moment with FanDuel, the official sports book partner of the NFL. All right, last segment. All right, all right let's, just, let's just do a, a recap here. A recap of my top picks and my new latest mock draft that will fully that will be fully released later on in the week. I got the Houston Rockets selecting Victor Wembanyama number one, no brainer there. I got the Detroit Pistons selecting Scoot Henderson at number two, and number three I have the Charlotte Hornets with Brandon Miller. Number four I have the San Antonio Spurs selecting Amin Thompson. Number five I have Keontae George going to Orlando, and at number six I have the Washington Wizards selecting Nick Smith Jr. At number seven, I have the Toronto Raptors, which is very weird that the Raptors are in the lottery again. I thought they were going to be better. And I have them selecting Asura Thompson, who is the twin brother of Amin Thompson. And like Amin, bouncy athlete, advanced court vision, and the versatility to be able to impact the games on both sides of the floor. I think he's a, a very good defender. And it's very common knowledge that Amin is the better prospect and he's considered the better passer of the two and is the more natural league ball handler. But I think that Asur can be a really good ball, ball handler and, and passer and can initiate the offense. I think he defers a little bit to his brother and they've spent a lot of time playing together. They're back playing together this year, which I don't necessarily like because they're just like, I mean, you got the two best players in the overtime elite league and they're on the same team. But I, I, I get why they did it. But I do think that eventually he is going to be a a primary ball handler or, or the lead initiator for a team because his vision. I mean, there's a chance that he can go to a team where he is the best passer on the team. And then I also think with his shooting struggles, He's best suited to have the ball as opposed to playing off the ball because, I mean, you'd be able to shrink the floor with, with him playing off the ball. So I think that, like I said, I think he's going to be somebody's primary ball handler in the very near future. Now, as far as the fit in Toronto, interesting. Interesting to say the least. One, Toronto's like four years removed from their only NBA title, and I thought that with the talent on their roster that they'd be better and they're just at this weird crossroads. I mean, they have Pascal Siakam, who 
is more than likely going to be an all-star. Then you got Scotty Barnes, who was the rookie of the year last year. So, you know, those guys are likely to stay. And then if they decide to be sellers within the next couple of weeks at the trade deadline, Fred Van Vliet can, they can probably get some value for him. They can definitely get some value for OG and Anobi, even though I read like they want like a lot of picks for him. Gary Trent, if they want to move him, he has some value. So if they decide to like restart their rebuild or whatever, they do have some valuable trade assets. I have no idea what direction they're going to go in. But as far as like a fit, Thompson would be another long athletic defender somebody that can defend multiple positions they kind of play this like real positionless basketball there um he does have some similar skill sets to scotty barnes they're not a one of one but they are there are some similarities there now this is what i would do and messiah is one of the best in the game but i would throw a blank check at dave love dave love is a renowned shooting coach has worked with a long list of players and has helped them become much better shooters dave love is canadian and and i know dave personally very very good dude but you got to throw him a blank check and say hey dave I, I know you're making money and i know you have a business traveling all around and working with people improve as a shooter but what do you want how, how much money do you need because if we're drafting a sore thompson and even we got Scotty Barnes on the roster. They need to improve as a shooter. If you can help both guys to improve to around 36% from three, it is well worth the money. I mean, let's just throw out a number. Let's just say they gave him a contract, paying him a million dollars a year. Well, if a sword Thompson ends up being a 36% shooter from three, and he is a you know someone that other teams have to guard, that is worth well over $1 million in value for the Toronto Raptors. I would throw Dave Love a, a blank check, and you, you're giving money back to a fellow. Not giving money, but you're hiring a fellow Canadian. So I, that would just be my choice there. All right. At number eight, I have the Portland Trailblazers selecting Gigi Jackson. I'm a big Gigi Jackson guy. I think that he would be my top pick in the 2024 draft if he stayed in his regular class. Currently averaging about 16.7 rebounds. The shooting numbers aren't aren't really good. 39-32-64. He's on a bad team. Team that's 1-5 and five in conference play. But despite the fact that his team is losing and he hasn't been the most efficient, I believe in his upside. The shot-making flashes are crazy. The footwork is impressive. The confidence is there. And he just has these natural scoring instincts. And he can play at the minimum a role as like a a finisher, and I think he's going to easily develop into a pick-and-pop guy. I think Gigi Jackson is going to be an all-star. I do. I think he's going to be an all-star, and I think that when it's all said and done, he might end up being a top-five player in this class. May not go top-five right now, but I think when it's all said and done, he will be a top-five player in this class. Because you look at any draft. I mean, you can go down, you can go down a list. Not every lottery pick is going to pan out and be good. There's some guys that are going to be some big misses. And I think Gigi Jackson is going to be one of the guys that makes it. Now, the fit for Portland, I like it. I think it's a great fit. Maybe I'm a little biased because I'm a Blazers fan. I do like Gigi Jackson. But I think that it is a great place to develop. I think he can develop next to Shaden Sharp. I think that, um, one, Gigi is playing college ball in his hometown I think going to Portland I mean it it is a little far from home but I think that it's probably one of the easier adjustments as far as like the city and the pace of the city as far as like NBA standards so if he is a a um you know I mean he's just young he's 18 years old so for any guy that's leaving the comfort of their hometown for the first time I, I think that you know fit and veteran leadership and having like a strong um, group of people around him in the locker room is important and I think Portland has that with Dame Lillard I mean you look at Ant Simons he came in very young kind of out of high school he's developed into 
a really good player who I think is going to be an all-star down the line. So I just think that Portland would be a very good fit. And then the Blazers youth movement with Sharp and a guy like Gigi Jackson, I think that would be very good. I mean, it would be a very good future for the Portland Trail Blazers. All right, at number nine, I have the Orlando Magic selecting Cam Whitmore. And Whitmore's been up and down, 6'7", 225, going to be the first one and done since Tim Thomas. He's been up and down. He missed a lot of time early this year after he went uh, underwent surgery. Is that even right? How you say that? Well, he had surgery on his thumb in October, so he missed like the first month of the season. And like I said, it's been up and down. He's had games where he's looked like the guy that a lot of people thought would be third pick in the draft. He had a 26-point game on 11 of 18 shooting against Xavier. And this is an Xavier team that's really good. And it really just gave you a glimpse of his talent. And he has this unique blend of, like, power, athleticism, great motor, and outside shooting. But when I say he's been down, there's been games where he's really struggled. Like, for example... St. John. St. John's is not a powerhouse by any means, but combined, he's 5 of 19 shooting on the against St. John's in their two games that he's played. St. John's like 3 and 6, and then he had a single-digit game against UConn, and then he had a game, I think he had like 8 points against Georgetown. Now, Georgetown is bad. I don't know if you've been following, but Georgetown is... They have won a game in conference play, and they've lost 15 out of their 20 games. And that was a game that I expected him to dominate, but Despite the inconsistency, he's still young. He'll only be 18 on draft night, and he looks like a grown man. Like, And I've said it before. Some of these 18-year-olds, like it was Jalen Duran last year and Cam Whitmore this year, do not look like 18-year-olds when I was 18 years old. Cam Whitmore looks like he's 25. Like he's built like, I mean, he's been working out in a – college or nba weight room i mean he is just physically advanced now the fit in orlando terrible i think it would be very awful uh i mean franz wagner and paulo ben carroll both play the three and the four and those are the positions that i think that cam whitmore is best at and i just jonathan isaac is coming back or he he played the game i just don't think it is the best fit and he'd be playing – he plays the same position as where Orlando's highest-paid player and their two best players spend the bulk of their time. So I don't necessarily like to fit there for him personally. But Orlando can make some changes, which I don't think Wagner or Ben Carroll <laughs> would be part of any of those changes. But, again, I just don't think that would be the ideal fit. And I really don't know a good fit for – anybody to draft going to Orlando, which has a chance to have two picks in the lottery this year um, with their own pick and then the Bulls pick as part of the uh, Wendell Carter Vucevic trade. So <laughs> it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens around draft time with Orlando and if agents are actually going to be interested in sending their client there. All right, the last pick of my top 10 mock draft, it is the New Orleans Pelicans, and I have them selecting Casey Wallace. Casey Wallace, six four guard from Kentucky. He is just the epitome of steady. Doesn't have a lot of flash and flair to his game to the point where people think that he may not have a great upside because his game is just isn't really sexy and flashy. But you have to give him the Kentucky bump. Well, you don't have to, but I will. I'm going to give him the Kentucky bump. You look at Devin Booker, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Tyler Hero. Tyrese Maxey, just to name a few. And these are just like recent guards that were drafted out of Kentucky that outperformed their draft position and had more game than they were able to show at Kentucky. So if you're a guard and you're at Kentucky, likely you've sacrificed a lot of your individual, um, I mean, not only just individual, like, statistic statistical numbers but you just sacrifice your game to fit into Kentucky's system and you know that when you're going into Kentucky now the fit in New Orleans would be I mean I, I like it uh, it wouldn't offer like an immediate starting role that is going to be CJ McCollum's job they also have Devontae Graham they got Kyra Lewis they got Jose Alvarado but I do think that 
Wallace could eventually make Alvarado expendable. Alvarado is a guy, I mean, he it's a great story. Undrafted and is playing like 20 minutes a game for the Pelicans. Played a, a role for them in the playoffs. Has the absolute, well, depending on how you look at it, the absolute worst contract or the best contract in the NBA. He signed like a four-year Six and a half million dollar deal. So you're you're getting like this crazy amount of value. A guy playing twenty minutes a game for only I'm not good at math, but I mean that's not <laughs> two million dollars a year. He's not making two million dollars a year. Where you got guys making thirty five million dollars a year that aren't as productive, I should say. Uh, not necessarily as productive, but it's I mean, again. He has the best contract in the NBA from a team perspective. From a player perspective, it is the absolute worst. But that's what happens when you're undrafted. And um, But I think that Alvarado is someone that could be expendable if Casey Wallace is on the floor. You're going to get the same level or close to the same level of, of defense, but a bigger version. And you're going to get a, a guy that I think has more upside as a shooter. And... You know, I think Casey Wallace is going to be good in New Orleans, but New Orleans has a lot of a lot of overlapping skill sets. Also, I mean, you can say that last year they drafted Dyson Daniels, but I think he's going to be more so as a as a connector. So um, the fit for Casey's in New Orleans, if this is the pick, doesn't like guarantee automatically a, a starting role, but have a chance to be on a winning team and learn from one of the best vets in the league and CJ McCollum. Well, that wraps up this episode. It's just my top 10, and I will have more this week. But thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, you got to check out the Game to Game Podcast. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. So follow the Game to Game podcast on the Locked On NBA channel, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, this is Rafael Barlow. Hope you have a happy Monday, and I am out.